Okay. Uh, I'm presenting a speech on SQL injection and out of band channeling. Uh, my name is uh, Patrick Carlson. I work for a small firm called Inspected, where I'm one of the owners. Uh, I also uh, founded a website called Secure.net back in the uh, year 2000, where I published some of my uh, tools. I currently work with uh, penetration testing and um, application security reviews, source code reviews, general information security audits, basically. I'm going to present a speech on SQL injection with a focus on out-of-band channeling. And I'm going to show a number of examples using this technique, and I'm going to finish off the, uh, the talk with a demonstration of how this can be performed. And the reason why is because when we perform our tests, we still see a lot of vulnerable applications. However, um, because applications are more hardened today maybe than before, it's, it's a bit troublesome to get the data out of them sometimes. And of course, tunneling data is fun. I'm not going to go through the basics of SQL injection that much, because uh, it's quite a tight, quite, um, tight schedule. And I hope that you're comfortable with, uh, with SQL injection in, in order to understand everything here. I'm not presenting any arsenal of tools in order to automatically exploit this kind of uh, vulnerabilities, and obviously not presenting a silver bullet solution to all SQL injection problems. Doing a very brief recap of SQL injection. It's a high-risk security vulnerability. Uh, we usually find it in uh, web applications, but it's not limited to web application. Um, and it's, the, it's when you have the ability to inject arbitrary SQL code through poorly validated application parameters. And one might argue that this is due to inadequate design or due to uh, improper validation controls. Um, Having proper validation controls obviously rules out other problems such as cross-site scripting, so it's always a good idea to have it. However, it's also even better to separate the data from the actual SQL code, not like building uh, by concatenating strings, because then you usually run into these problems. And um, depending on the privileges and patch levels of the database server, the consequences may obviously range from troublesome to devastating. And a common misconception might be that usually just, just forms and URL parameters are vulnerable to this kind of, kind of problem. However, we, usually, we, we find problems in cookies and referrer fields and user agent fields in the HTTP headers. Like, for example, when you implement a logging mechanism in order to log um, improper or failed login attempts, for example, you write a, write a row into a database and you use the insert statement, then you append a lot of data, like which web browser is the user using. Putting a couple of quotes in that user agent field, you can, you can, have, um, you can actually get, get control of the data. So looking at a classic example, we have the authentication function, where you log in using your username and password. So basically, the, the user supplies a username and password, and the database retrieves a user ID for this user, which is used throughout the application. In this case, we have no uh, parameter validation, so we can enter any data we wish, to, wish for. And by entering, for example, a quote, and or one equals one, dash, dash, we uh, circumvent the whole uh, login function and get access to the, to the application. So basically, that's SQL injection in a very brief Recap. So, our band channeling. Well, it relies on traditional SQL injection weaknesses for exploitation. However, contrary to normal SQL injection or in band injection, it uses an alternative channel to return data. So, for example, you could be using um, timing. Um, like, for example, does the first user begin with an A? Then you wait five seconds. You would, you would know that, OK, there's the user starting with A. You could use HTTP, which I'll show later in, in a couple of slides, where you um, 
send the data in a HTTP request. And you could use DNS, which is the focus on, on, the, on the speech later on. Um, and several different approaches exist, which uh, depend on the backend database. If you're running SQL, Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle, you might have to choose a different approach in order to, to ex exploit this vulnerability. So when is um, exploiting using out-of-band channels interesting? Well, when you don't have any detailed error messages which you can rely on to extract data, it could be useful. When you uh, ga gain ac access to, or when you're able to control a SQL query very late in the query, like in the or order by clause, which I will show also later on, when you're able to inject a second query through batching, when you do a semicolon and then you append a lot of uh, SQL code after, and when results in some way are being limited or filtered, for example, you just get the first row of a, of a, of a table, and uh, when, out, when firewall rules are lax, when you can open a channel back to, the, back to one of your DNS servers or one of your uh, HTTP servers or whatever. Um, contrary to, to blind SQL injection, when you do a lot of queries in order to extract little data, out-of-band channeling turns, it a bit, uh, turns, turns this around. You do a lot of injection or one single query, and you retrieve all the data with, with one single query. And obviously, when blind SQL injection looks like the only option, this might come in handy in many, many cases. Um, and I believe it's a much more efficient way of extracting data. So we have three, three examples here uh, where we get control of the data, where, of the SQL statement, uh, very, in the first case, very late in the order by clause. We have a store procedure, which actually logs on the user. It runs, returns true or false. So basically, we'll have a hard time here retrieving any data. Uh, but using out-of-band channeling, we could retrieve anything from the database. We have also a late, late, the last query here, which simply returns a single row. And depending on a number of different factors, which we'll discuss, um, the channel chosen can be more or less suitable. I'll show you three different channels, and I'll finish up by demonstra demonstrating the DNS channel. Um, what I'm going to talk about first is Open Rosette. It's a SQL Server um, function. And I'm also going to talk briefly about the UTL HTTP package in Oracle, and then uh, finishing with a couple of slides of uh, DNS. So Open Rosette, I decided to include this in my demonstration, even though that it's not very likely to be able to exploit it nowadays because it's restricted in most SQL Server environments. Uh, but it illustrates the, the problem and it shows you a good picture of how everything works. Um, Open Rosette allows you to retrieve information from an alternative data provider. And usually it can be used together with Union in order to, to extract data, data from another database for a neighbor database. And it's uh, disabled by default in SQL Server 2005. And in uh, SQL Server 2000 post Service Pack 3, it's also disabled and available only to sysadmin users. The syntax, not very. Here's a classic example of enumerating data from a neighbor database. So basically, we do a union of our first select statement, and we do uh, the open roasted part, followed by we need to guess a correct user ID here. So we're like guessing system administrator blank password. And we try to uh, extract data from the users table on the server 10, 10, 10, 10. And we try to join this result in, our, in, in the original uh, SQL query in order to get the results back in one, one web page. So basically, we're on the top talking to the, the web server. The web server communicates to the database server. The database server uh, executes a query to our very secret database, fetches the data, and joins it all together in the, in the uh, first 
SQL Server and return it, it back to our uh, web server. So how is this relevant in regards to out-of-band channeling? Well, open roast can be reversed. So instead of using it to query data, we can use it to insert data. So we can actually, we can, we can fetch the data from one source and insert it to another. And the destination database could be any host reachable from the source. And uh, in this way, we can uh, insert data into one of our own database servers through batching statements. So uh, we try to terminate the first query, and then we do a semicolon, and then we add an insert into Open Roset, which would look something like this. So we have the first query here, where we fetch um, user ID, the login function, remember, from the first slides. We do a semicolon after our password, and we do an insert into Open Roset. We point out our server database server from, for which we already know the username and password. And then using the, 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 the first select statement actually points out which table we want to insert the data into in our database. And the second query uh, says which, which table we want to fetch the data from. So basically, you don't, you don't need to know the, any username or password since it's our own database. And uh, after the address, we have a comma 443. This is the which port we want to use in order to insert our data. So you can choose any port here. You can use HTTPS, HTTP, FTP, Telnet, whatever come, becomes suitable in, a, in the environment you're actually attacking. You can also use it for port scanning. So you could use a higher timeout. You use like a timeout of five. Then you can easily check which ports are allowed outbound. And once you find a suitable port, you can just execute everything. In order to illustrate it with a picture, it will look so, lot, something like this. We still talk to the, to the web application server, which talks to the database server, which opens up a, a connection through our firewall back to us. So the obstacles in this solution is that you need, a, you need to have the database server where you want to insert your data needs to, needs to be reachable from the source database. So um, in a tight network, you might have problems um, reaching the correct ports. Also, we need to have the source and destination tables. They need to be identical. We need to know what columns we have in our uh, user table in order to insert them in our own user tables. We, know, we have to know the column names, the data types, the size of the data types. Usually when we do this kind of attack, we're successful on using HTTPS or HTTP or any of the, the common uh, protocols. And as we have in SQL Server, we have something called sys objects and sys columns, which are um, meta tables containing information about all objects in the database, like all tables, all columns for all, all tables, and all data types for all columns. So by knowing these, the layout of these tables, we can create our own similar tables in our database, and we can extract all the data we need. So we ex first, we start off by extracting. OK, so, so which tables do you actually have? Oh, well, I have the user table, the payments table. Oh, that's interesting. So we do an identical payments table, and then we just extract everything through this uh, batching technique. Looking at the summary of the open roster, then, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, only sysadmin members uh, post SQL Server Service Pack 3 are allowed to actually access this, uh, these functions. But um, for some reason, we've been able to do it quite a lot this year. So actually, it's still possible in, in, in many installations. Um, most hardening guides suggest disabling OpenRoset altogether. You need to have a direct connection back to your database server. So in, uh, in high security environments, this is most probably not, po not possible of doing. And it's limited to SQL Server, obviously. Just to illustrate that I'm not just picking on SQL Server, I decided to include the UTL HTTP package as well from Oracle. Basically, what the UTL HTTP package allows you to do is to perform a, a GET request on a web page. The result from the web page where the first 2,000 bytes are returned in the answer, like in a normal query. So you do SELECT. In this case, we do UTL HTTP request. 
and we try to, to download Oracle's web page. We'll get the 2,000 first bytes of this web page. Um, and this can also be um, exploited in order to, to tunnel data through this, this type of uh, function. What we actually do is that we're dynamically building the uh, URL that we're retrieving. So we specify one of our own web servers, and then we dynamically fetch table data in order to build our URL. And then by looking at the web server log files on our web server, we can see what, what the data actually is in the, in the ta database tables. So this is an example of late exploitation. Typically when, you, when we've seen tables on different web pages, you have headers where you can sort the table data in a, in a web page. Sometimes this is achieved through uh, sending, ascending or descending as a parameter in the URL. Uh, this data is then used in order to sort the, the table data and uh, oh, in order to match the actual topic that you clicked on in the header. In some cases, this is injected through concatenation of, uh, of uh, strings and just concatenated at the end of a static SQL statement. In Oracle, you can, if you return exactly one row of data, you could use this in order to order this, uh, this um, first table that I just described. So in this case, we're actually injecting um, a parenthesis instead of descending, for example, and then we do a UTL HTTP request. We try to access our web page, secure.net. Uh, the URL is slash inj for injection. And then we do a select username and the user password from table logins where row num is less than two. So this will return exactly one row from our login table. So basically we're asking the web server to, uh, to start, the UTL, uh, start UTL HTTP and uh, perform a request to our server. This UTL HTTP package accepts proxies so in an environment where we have a proxy server, you just tag along the proxy name and you go through the proxy out on the internet. Looking at the log files, you would see something like this with the usernames and passwords separated by an uh, underscore. And looking at, at Oracle, you can see that many databases still have this package unrestricted. It's uh, available to the public user, which is a user a pseudo user which everybody belongs to, or a role actually. So anyone can, can execute this function. So even if you have very limited uh, access in the Oracle database, you could use this attacking technique in order to extract data. Um, commonly, firewalls tend to be less strict on outbound traffic. So uh, accessing HTTP or HTTPS and, or going through a proxy usually solves this. The limitations, yeah, well, it's limited to Oracle database server. Hardening guides suggest disabling this, obviously. Um, and one other limitation, it requires a direct outgoing connection to our attacking or to our web server, which we control. Slide 30. DNS and out-of-band channeling. So, mm -hmm. DNS. It's a hierarchical protocol. Most of you use it daily. So in order to illustrate the, the, the benefit of using DNS, let's assume we manage a DNS server for the zone secure.net. So if somebody at the, the corporation X tries to look up a host in our domain, it, the query will find its way to us as it's a hierarchical protocol. So this would allow us to monitor queries in, uh, for subdomains or hosts in our domain. So even if you have a hardened database, it's our experience that usually you allow DNS. And um, most internal DNS servers are allowed to forward their queries. And um, most hardening guides, if you look at the general, general hardening guides available from the vendors, they fail to, to actually mention a lot of these packages which can be used in order to, to do DNS resolution. So if we could some way trigger a DNS resolution in a database, we would have an indirect channel to a D DNS server of our choice 
as we're controlling the, the domain name of the, of the re name resolution, we just point it to our domain, and the, the query will travel all the way back to our DNS server. So if we, if we could trigger DNS, we could ask for any host in our, in our zone. So in this case, we do a DNS resolution to our corporate DNS server, which forwards the query to the uh, authoritative service for .NET, which in their turn forwards it to our DNS server for the secure .NET DNS zone. Both Microsoft and Oracle provide uh, functions and store procedures and packages in order to do DNS resolution. Um, some of these functions are executable by the public user. So basically what I'm saying that anyone can execute these, these packages or store procedures. And uh, like I previously said, some of them are, are not mentioned in hardening guides, uh, which makes them available in a lot of, lot of database servers. So in SQL Server, a number of store procedures accept UNC path names. A UNC name is, uh, is um, when you point out a share on a network, uh, net network server. And if you point a UNC path to a fully qualified domain name, it will result in a DNS resolution being performed. And this can be used in order to channel database information to an attacker. So by looking, for example, at the extended store procedure XP Deer tree, XP file exists, XP get file details, SP add job step, they all accept UNC paths in their file parameter. Uh, the backup database, when you, choose, when you choose to backup a database as the database owner of a database, you can point it to a file where it should be backed up. You can point this file to, a, to any network-based server. So basically, you could do DNS resolution through the backup command as well. If you look at Oracle, you have the UTL in adder package, which basically does DNS resolution. That's what, what's, what it's meant for. You have the UTL HTTP that I described, where you do a connection to a, a request to a web server. So even if you're not allowed to, to talk to the web server in outbound traffic, maybe your, the firewall blocks it, you, still, uh, you can still use the package in order to do uh, DNS resolution. So DNS traffic will most probably go through the firewall and out to our um, DNS server. There are packages like UTL TCP, and uh, most probably there are a lot of more packages. I've just had a brief look in both SQL Server and Oracle, and I found these, these ones so far. And what I was interesting, interested in was packages that have uh, public execute privileges, so basically who, who, whoever can execute. So even if you just have read access in a database, you can still execute these packages. So how do we extract data using DNS? Well, basically we need to put the whole data or, the, or a payload, so to speak, in the DNS host name. As the zone name, secure.net, just directs it to our DNS server. The actual host name is the query that's being performed to our DNS server. This means that our host name has to be built dynamically using table data. So we stuff all the data into the host name and then we try to fire it away using a DNS resolution and it will end up in our database or in our uh, DNS server. And by using cursors and variables in SQL, you could uh, actually build uh, these host names dynamically. Once you have built the host name, you just fire it away using XP Deer tree or XP get file details or file exists or whatever your store procedure of choice is. So I'm providing a sample here. We have the, the variable s declared, where we start off by saying that we want to use the XP Deer tree store procedure in the master database. We add a double backslash in order to uh, explain that we, that we want to use the UNC path. We tag along the user underscore name function, which will result to the current username. And then we just tag along our suffix or our domain, dot in for injection, dot secure, dot net. Then another backslash, and then the directory we want to perform a directory tree inside. The directory tree is never being performed. As I'm, in our demonstration, I'll always be returning uh, the loopback address 
in the DNS resolution. So basically, we're just interested in the name resolution. We're not interested in doing a directory tree or anything. We're just interested in performing the DNS resolution. That's it. We can do the same thing with basically any parameter, any function in SQL Server. In this case, we're fetching the, the server name with the name of the instance as well. And we're tagging it along with our domain name in order to get the resolution to work. So looking at DNS, we, uh, we have some challenges. DNS records are cached. Both, this is true for both um, successful DNS requests and um, DF host names that are not found. And we also have length restrictions on our fully qualified domain name, 255 characters, and on our labels. The labels is the data between the dots in a, in a fully qualified domain name. We have the problems with uh, some characters, which cannot be in a, in a fully qualified domain name. And the obvious solutions are setting a low or zero time to live. If you have control of the DNS server, in our case, we, I'll, I'll show you a, a small DNS server written in Perl, which always returns a very low TTL. But if you're running TCP dump on a bind database, for, exa for example, you, you might not have the uh, opportunity to set a low TTL value. In these cases, you can always um, you can add a unique value to the data being queried. So you tag it along before the actual data you want to see. So performing, a, performing the same request 10 times always sends a different seed, so to speak, which will always result in unique DNS resolutions being made. And the obvious solution for uh, length, length limitations are obviously to truncate or split values exceeding length. And um, for the nasty characters, we just convert them prior to our resolution. If you look at the uh, caching part then, uh, either you, you try to set a low TTL value or in the demonstration, I'll be using a checksum value or a, or a seed. I'm using the checksum function in SQL Server, which takes one parameter, um, and I'm feeding it the current timestamp. So if you do subsequent requests, it will always be a bit different. And the end, res end result looks similar to the following. You have a large number in, in the beginning, you have a dash, and then you have your table data, followed by the zone where you want to do the resolution in. So modifying our first example, we would actually add um, the, current, the checksum of the current timestamp. We need to convert it to a character stream using the convert varchar function. And then it's basically exactly the same. So looking at RFC 1035, you see that the um, label restriction cannot, or labels, they cannot exceed the length of 63 characters. The fully qualified domain name must be 255 characters or less. So the labels are actually the data between the dots. This means that we need to, in some way, slice and dice our data in order to fit these restrictions. And our goal in this case is to split a large string and send it over several consecutive DNS requests. So my proposed layout for this is to actually do it this way. So you have, um, you have first an uh, uh, indicator that this, the following 0x is a hex string, where our data will be uh, fitted with uh, delimited, uh, delimiting dots. You have an ID for the specific data being sent. Then you then have a part number, which specif specifies why, why, when we chopped up the data for suitable fully qualified domain names. It says, OK, this is part one of seven, where the max part describes how many parts there are in total. So as DNS travels over UDP, you can have some uh, loss, or you can have the packets coming in the wrong, wrong um, sequence. This way, you have, uh, you have control on how many packages you're actually supposed to receive and in what order. I'm not using the part and max part in the demonstration at all. However, uh, if I would use it in the future over a more reliable network, I would use it. 
So by first converting our data to hex, we don't need to worry about any odd characters showing up. So what we're actually doing is taking any data type and using the convert or cost function in SQL Server and converting it to binary. When we have it in binary form, you can then use the function var, var bin to hex string, which converts our binary data into a hex string starting with 0x and then uh, letters from A to F and 0 to 9. So we no longer have a problem with the characters which will break our DNS resolution. The hex string then needs to be divided into adequate pieces. And this is um, most easily done by using the substring function. So what we actually do is that we first split our data into suitable fully qualified domain name lengths. When we have these blocks, we split them into smaller blocks divided by uh, dots, so they fit our label restrictions. We then tag along the ID and part information, and when it's all built, we send it using the expedir tree command. And like I said earlier, the expedir tree doesn't do a directory tree in this case. The only purpose of, of the expedir tree is to perform a DNS resolution in order to send our data to our DNS server. This means that our receiving part, the DNS server, reverses the process and prints the data out. So basically we're sending character by character, but in larger chunks. And um, using this strategy, we need only to inject once. So we inject one large query and retrieve all table data instead of using like 10 requests in order to get three characters. Um, Basically, only the size of the, of the variable receiving the data is our limitation. And obviously, those DNA, uh, database servers that don't do DNS won't, will be a sort of a limitation, too. So this is time for the demonstration, and uh, hopefully it will work. So I just started our small DNS server here. We're talking to, uh, to um, uh, VMware server here in, the, in another window. And it's running uh, Windows with the SQL Server 2005, Service Pack 2, all hot fixes, everything. And um, the DNS server is set to my uh, host where this black window is running. Oh, yeah. So, let's see if we can. Yeah, like this. So I'll be cutting some, copy pasting some data here in the windows, let's see. This web application is uh, just some application available on the internet where I just trashed all the back end and just replaced it with vulnerable code basically. So it has nothing to do with this actual website and I'm running everything locally. So basically it's not giving us any detailed error messages, just saying that an error occurred, please try again later. So we're gonna to try to inject some data into this. And we um, start off by injecting the first one that I showed you with the, with the username. So we get a query, it says uh, webshop underscore reader dot ini dot secure dot net. The little Perl script I've written just chops off everything called ini dot secure dot net. So running it in a non verbose mode won't show the queries and uh, actually produce a more readable format. I'm going to put this small DNS server on the same web page as I'm putting the presentation later on. It's not yet there. Looking at the um, server name. In order to, uh, as the, um, 
Let's see. As the server name is actually um, has a backslash in it, as the instance is, is written as well, we need to tag along this um, small piece here with the replace where it converts the server property, it converts the backslash to underscore. This is before we start chopping up data. I'll show you when we chop up the data using the bigger SQL Server functions. We won't be needing this. So in order to defeat our caching problem, I'll show you the, uh, the query using the current timestamp as well. So it tags along the 21, 55, blah, blah, blah. If we run it once more, it should give us slightly higher value. So we can do subsequent queries and always be sure to get a proper resolution. I'm going to switch into non-verbose mode now because uh, it's not going to be as pretty <laughs> if I don't. Like I mentioned, we're going to have a look inside the sys objects and sys columns tables, which all describe the um, we have a small, a tiny injection code here. <laughs> so basically, we inject it here, and it start up, starts up a bit slow, but hopefully, we'll get the rest of the data as well. Hopefully. There it goes. So our little query is in the background. I need to scroll the screen in order for you to see the whole. But it's in the slides. So so what we see here is, is first our database name, which is WebShop. Basically, this script that I just injected goes through all databases in the database server. For all databases, it looks for if it has permissions. It looks for all tables. For all tables, it looks for the column names. And for all column names, it results the data type. And for all data types, it results the size of the data type. So what we have here is a complete, we have a complete database schema, basically. And uh, we see that we have the web shop. We have a table called payments. We see a purchase ID, card holder, card type, card number, expiry, everything. We have a products table where we're pricing information, which might be handy to change. Um, we have something called users with usernames and passwords. So as we know our, we now know our data or our table definitions, we can um, move to the next tiny SQL statement here. which might work as well. OK, so we get all the usernames and passwords, obviously with Swedish passwords. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, and then moving right along to the interesting stuff, we look at the credit card numbers. Uh, yeah, I think so. Here they go. Please don't write them down. <laughs> so we have the the username or the full full name as it's as it's shown on the on the actual card. We have the card type, we have the number, we have the CVV. You want it? <laughs> um yeah, well, basically that's it. That's the end of the demonstration and the end of the talk.